All right, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me welcome Todd from Four Kitchens, who's going to introduce our keynote for today. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Todd. I'm CEO and co-founder of Four Kitchens. Um, but enough about me. Uh, we're here to talk about Angie. Uh, so Angie, back in 2008, you and me and some other folks went to a Drupal.org documentation for Angie. So we're in Toronto, and uh, we're, we spend days working on trying to figure out how to reorganize documentation in Drupal.org because it was a mess. Was? Um, <laughs> no offense. Um, and uh, we, we went out to dinner one night after working really late, uh, and we met up with one of Angie's former co-workers, Jeff Walker, Walker. Uh, and he had his daughters with him. Now, I was, I was already pretty blown away by, first of all, being invited to come to this thing in Toronto. And then like to be there with Angie and with Patty Berry and all these people that I had like really looked up to and admired for so long. And I didn't know a lot about Angie. We hadn't really spent a whole lot of time talking before that trip. Um, but I, uh, I I was super intimidated. So we all go out to dinner because I like, <laughs> Uh, because I knew that she was like really, all I knew was that she was really, really good at what she did. And, uh, and that was definitely the case, um, and is the case. So we were at a dinner, and um, I'm terrible at talking with kids. Like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. And Jeff Walker's 10 or 11 year old daughter was sitting there playing like Nintendo, whatever the little Nintendo thing was at the time. Uh, and we're all kind of going around the table, trying to make a small talk and get to know one another. And, um, everybody's kind of saying, like, well, what do you do? What do you do? What's going on? And so I asked Jeff Walker's daughter, like, kind of jokingly, as, so what do you do? You know, it's like, oh, I'm an adult asking a kid, like, what do you do? Like, you know, ha, ha, ha. And she just says very matter-of-factly, I'm a kid. <laughs> and without skipping a beat, Angie said, and I bet you're really great at it. <laughs> and, like, that taught me so much in that moment about how to communicate. Because I just was like, here I am trying to make this dumb, like, well, we all work, we all got jobs, jobs, so I'm making that kind of joke to a 10-year-old kid. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But Angie knew exactly what to say and, and how to say it. So um, I wanted to share that story with you because Angie is just an awesome communicator and collaborator. And she is also, additionally, uh, a world-class developer which makes her really ideally suited to be project lead for Drupal 8 and to lead an open source community, which is incredibly, incredibly hard to do. Um, I can't imagine doing what Angie has done for the past three years? How long? It's been a long time. Since 2008. <laughs> oh. Since 2008, she has been like slogging away at getting this thing out the door and getting people excited about it and balancing hundreds of people's passionate people's, sometimes unreasonable people's demands, um, I, could, I, I could never do that job. Uh, and I'm, I'm just like so in awe that you've been able to, to do this for, for so long. Um, she also really exemplifies like the, the transparency and the, the kind of personality that makes the Drupal community really cool and really special and unique. Um, and I, I really appreciate how open you've been about yourself over the past few years. and, and uh, that really actually gets people kind of excited, you know, and and I think that we could use a lot more transparency in the world, and not just in our software, but um, in how we communicate and how we treat each other, especially um, these days. So, uh, if you could please join me in welcoming and most importantly thanking Angie Webchick. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. That, wow. Um, in addition to that, the other thing I can tell you about Todd is uh, when I, uh, so I was the Drupal 7 uh, maintainer before I was the uh, Drupal 8, because I'm stupid and I don't know how to say no to things. Um, so I led the development of Drupal 7 um, as well. So it's all my fault. Um, but uh, at the end of that long slog, um, they presented me at the beginning of my uh, session with a 
trophy, a handmade trophy that said, for implementation of Hook Awesome, and I still have that on my mantle. <laughs> yes, that is made through Halifax, Montreal, Vancouver, like, yeah, it's, uh, it's really cool. All right, so let's see if we can get something other than mountains going up here, although mountains are really pretty. That did a thing. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Drupalcorn. I'm your host, Andy. All right. <laughs> now, after all of that, if this talk ends up sucking, I'm really sorry because uh, the thing I have to preface this with is this stuff is actively changing on the ground as we speak. Um, 8.2 uh, just hit beta on Wednesday. And so we uh, are actively in the throes of sifting through the remainders of the issues to figure out what's going to make it in, what's going to get postponed to the later release, this kind of thing. So this is very hot information off the top of my head, um, but it may or may not be accurate as of like five minutes from now. So just bear that in mind. Um, so a little bit about me. I work at, at Acquia in the office of the CTO. I, uh, I was recently promoted, promoted is a funny word, to product manager of the Drupal uh, 8 project, uh, well, along with Dries. Uh, we sort of manage the uh, feature set and the, um, you know, what features to target for different versions, this kind of a thing. And so I've been doing some fun stuff like reading or watching videos about CQ5 and WordPress and this kind of stuff. I've been doing a lot of enterprise voice for your benefit, so uh, that kind of thing. Um, I originally came in the community via Google Summer of Code. Uh, I was a person who was really passionate, and still am, but uh, I was like a teenager and I thought open source was amazing and it was like this really cool thing that I could obviously never be part of because I was just like a student, right, and I didn't know anything at the time. Google Summer of Code was this great gateway because it showed that anybody can contribute to open source if they just are passionate about what they do and they want to get started. And um, after that, I sort of dove headfirst into the community and started doing everything, including documentation and uh, things like that. So, um, I originally hail from Rochester, Minnesota, which is also famous for its <laughs> corn tower. So, you know, and I have to say, the cornhole commissioner has to be the best volunteer <laughs> title I've ever heard of in my life. I think whoever gets that is very blessed. All right. So, a little bit of what we're doing today. Um, and I, who here is a developer? Okay, good. Because there's a lot of this stuff that's a little like meaty, and I didn't know if like, what's a Drupal? Is anyone here what's a Drupal? It's okay, we won't bite. Okay, nobody here is a what's a Drupal, great. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, and this will probably be reviewed for most of you, but just in case, about a brief history of Drupal 8 and the initiatives, um, and then talk about some of the new initiatives and what those are, and then for each one of them, we're gonna talk about where is it at, what does it entail, uh, who to talk to, how to help, this kind of thing, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. Um, and since this is a brand new talk, I've never done it before, so we'll see how this goes, and feel free to heckle me as we go along. So, so a brief history of uh, Drupal 8, where I copy and paste a bunch of Dries' slides. Um, what is an initiative? So an initiative is a little bit special. It's, it's a big, all-encompassing you know, effort that we put in, and it's sort of guided by a number of different things. It's guided by product vision, it's guided by things like survey data or other kinds of usability testing, this kind of empirical evidence, um, a lot of discussion in the community. We're a very open and transparent community, so we like to talk about everything. All our dirty laundry is right there for everyone to see. Um, and then we also take some consideration into what our competitors are doing. And when all of those things come together, we call that an initiative. In Drupal 8, prior to its shipping, we had a number of official strategic initiatives. Um, things like, oh, that didn't work. No. Okay, you know what I need to do? I need to use this fancy clicker thing and not touch the laptop. Um, so we had things like configuration management, mobile, web services, blocks and layouts, these kinds of things. Um, and those were sort of the defining traits of what made Drupal 8 great and why hopefully people are starting to move to it now. In addition to that, we already also had a bunch of community initiatives where people just like you and I get itches that they want to scratch. So the, the front end developers were very upset about the fact that, you know, in order to do design in Drupal, you had to be like an expert level ninja in PHP. So they started an initiative called Twig, 
which use more of a, a regular templating system for, for that sort of stuff. Um, the accessibility folks really wanted it to go from, we're WK 2.0 compliant in Drupal 7, which is great, but they wanted to take that up a notch and go to WK AAA and do all kinds of new, fix some known holes that were running uh, into in the, the project and things like that. So people, there's, there's kind of two different ways that initiatives come about. They either come about because Dries says, this is something I'd really like you to work on, or they come about because someone is like, this makes me really upset and I'm gonna do something about it. So there's, there's multiple ways. Um, so Drupal 8 finally shipped um, last November, and that was a four and a half year development cycle, which was a doozy, I guess. Um, <laughs> sort of like almost half of Drupal's entire lifespan was spent in Drupal 8, so yeah, that was a bit of a thing. But yay, it shipped, woo! <laughs> Yeah, so that was good. Um, as part of that, we didn't ever want to have a four and a half year release cycle again, so we adopted this new release cycle. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about how this works. So every six months, roughly, oops, I don't know, my pointer's not showing up, but every six months we have a, uh, we increment that little middle number there, and that's called a minor release, so 8.0, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, and so on, until we run out of things that we can do in Drupal 8. Um, and each one of those goes through a development, a beta, and a release cycle process. And as soon as one of them goes into beta, meaning we don't we do any more features on that branch, then we open up the next branch and then we start putting stuff in there. So a long time ago, Dries had talked about this concept of like the release train is leaving the station. That's what we have now. We actually predicted six months in advance when 8.1 would ship and actually hit that date. Oh. And then we predicted six months in advance when 8.2 would go into beta, and we hit that date. So it's like, wow, things are happening. And the great thing about this is we used to have a lot of very visceral, emotional arguments about things, because if you didn't hit that feature freeze deadline in Drupal 8, your thing might not go in for four and a half years when Drupal 9 opened up. Now, if your thing doesn't make it in, it's like, ah, you got to wait six months. But, you know, six months is nothing compared to so. So this has been a really, really healthy change. The really exciting thing is in each of these minor releases, we can add new backwards compatible features. So it used to be you'd have to wait until we broke all of your APIs in order to get new fun, you know, fancy things. Now you get the new fancy things and you can use them on top of your existing site. Um, so this is great. Um, so we're currently here, Drupal 8.2 just went into beta, so we just froze the features in 8.2. So I'll talk a little bit about what made it in, what didn't make it in. Um, and then the rest of that will be 8.3, and I believe 8.3 comes out in March, but don't quote me on that. But it, handily, if you click that little link, it will tell you where, about it, where it goes up. All right. We also add this new innovation tool that I'm really excited about called experimental modules. So has anyone ever tried to get a patch in core before? Has anyone ever had a friend who did and said, no, thank you? <laughs> yeah, okay. So the way we typically do things in core, because you know people who use core include like governments and nonprofit organizations and huge media companies and yada, yada, yada. We have to be really careful about what we put in core and what things we change because we don't want to break people's stuff. Um, and so it used to be that in order to get a feature into core, it had to be meticulously you know, gone through, including security reviews, coding standards, performance, usability, accessibility, the whole gamut of everything. And then the challenge with that is you can often be like 200 comments into an issue before your thing actually you know, got to the point where it could be committed and by then you're sort of like fried and you're burnt out. And it also causes people to often focus on nitpicky details without looking at the overall picture of what you're trying to do and that can burn people out too. So the way experimental modules work is it's, a, it's, a, it's an area, sort of like a cordon off zone of known non-perfect stuff in core that we know has problems but we know that we want to ship with it eventually, so we create a space for that. And then we get them in as experimental and we work on them iteratively over time to improve them. And this is really great because before, the only way to really iteratively improve something is to put it in contrib, and then you're competing with 34,000 other projects and you have to know the special URL to get to it because the search is terrible and whatever. But anyway, um, so this way is great because then you just have a checkbox on installation. And it'll warn you in big scary letters like, please don't enable this on production and stuff. But you'll totally enable it on production. But anyway, <laughs> but there's exciting new stuff and I'm really, really thrilled about this because this allows us to 
to actually get real world user data on things as opposed to, well, at least seven people who argued a lot in the issue think this is good, so I guess, you know, so this is great. Um, so what do we want to put in these minor releases and how do we, you know, get those features in? So we did a survey back in DrupalCon New Orleans and about 3,000 people uh, responded. And this is what came out of that, um, that basically a bunch of these different initiatives that sort of combine the customer experience, what Dries calls the customer experience, meaning your end users, uh, the developer experience, and the editorial experience. Um, and you'll notice some of these are uh, existing initiatives that sort of already were on the list, like blocks and layouts and a few of those, um, just to kind of get them more better and that kind of thing. So. Um, what the rest of this talk is going to do is run through each of those initiatives, talk about where it's at, um, what's going to be coming down the pipe, this kind of thing. But before I jump into that, are there uh, any questions on that part? All right. You guys are raring to go. That's not, okay. So these are in descending order of um, how far along they are, meaning migrate already happened and is currently in the throes of like getting completed, and then we'll go on to... Uh, the last one, which I still can't remember, customer something, what was it? Uh, Cross-channel orchestration, which is currently like vaporware sci-fi stuff, so we're going <laughs> to go in that one. So, um, migrate. So what is migrate? So um, anybody here ever moved a major version, like from 6 to 7 or 5 to 6? or A lot of people, yeah. So in Drupal 7 and below, we had this awesome process meaning terrifying process, where what you would do is you would hit this little URL called update.php, and then in real time, it would make modifications to your production database. There's nothing scary about that. You know. And then if it bailed, you'd have to just restore from backup, and also your site would be down for 19 hours or however long it took to run that entire process. It was joyous, fun all around. So we don't do that anymore. As of Drupal 8, we have a migration path instead. And so what that means is you keep your existing site running as long as you need it to. You work on your new Drupal 8 site and you move your content over in spurts. And then when the Drupal 8 site is ready, you just cut the DNS over and you have zero downtime, um, which is really nice. You do have to build your site over from scratch, which kind of makes people upset. But on the other hand, you were basically building your Drupal 7 site from scratch anyway if you were migrating from, say, Drupal 5, because all the contrib modules, best practices, it's all different every time anyway, and this way you don't carry around a bunch of legacy baggage in your database that comes back to bite you. Um, so Drupal 8 comes with both a Drupal 6 and a Drupal 7 migration path, so you can move from either version. Anyone want to admit that they're still on Drupal 6? Yeah, I'm sorry. So Drupal 6 um, is technically end of life as of February of 2015, 16? February, anyway, it's at end of life. What that means is that we're no longer issuing security patches for it. Um, or the security team is not anyway, but I know there's some vendors that are offering long-term support and this kind of stuff for it. But uh, the, the good news though is Drupal 6 came out in 2008. So probably, hopefully, most of the really bad stuff already got knocked out. It's not like your site will be imminently hacked if you are still using Drupal 6. But you might want to look at moving off that soon because there's definitely no contrib modules being made for it yet, this kind of thing. So, um, so we focused on the 6 to 8 migration path first, more so than the 7 to 8, because 6 to 8 is a bit more urgent. Um, so as of 8.1, we ship with a migrate UI. And if you're more into command line things, there's also a contrib module called migrate upgrade that gives you drush commands. And essentially what you do is you provide the um, old database credentials, and it will just suck in all of your content into your new database, and then you can retry that as many times as you need. Uh, the current status is uh, we've got some major improvements done in 8.2. Uh, support for translated content, that's a big deal. Uh, the the 8.1 didn't support multilingual content, so we got that fixed. There's also a bunch of really bad bugs that got fixed, like little things like if you upgraded from 7 to 8, none of your loot users could log in. So that was kind of a thing, so that's <laughs> fixed now. Um, and they're working really hard on getting the architecture of Migrate uh, finalized so that we can get that out of experimental and into a full-fledged feature. Um, so if you want to help, and I'll post these slides because I don't need to read a bunch of links to you, um, but each of these sections has, if this is something that you're interested in helping in, here's where the main jumping off point is, here's where they meet, here's who to talk to, that kind of stuff. So um, migrate, it's a really good thing to work on. Um, now if you are still on Drupal 7, or heaven forbid Drupal 6, uh, there's a few tools that I just wanted to call out in this section that might be helpful to you. 
Um, one is a module called upgrade status as opposed to update status. And what this does is it will print a customized report based on the modules that themes that you have installed on your site. And it will say this one is already ported for Drupal 8 or it's including core. This one has a dev release. This one we have no porting information for, that kind of thing. So that's a really handy kind of like status report thing so you can kind of monitor that and see when would be a good time for you personally to move uh, to Drupal 8. There's also, uh, if you want more nuanced information than just like a status report, there's the Drupal Contrib Porting Tracker, which is a uh, project in, uh, in Contrib that allows each module to have its own little issue where it keeps track of what's the current development status, where is development taking place. Sometimes they're working off on GitHub somewhere until it's ready, this kind of thing. So that's definitely the most nuanced information for your available modules. Uh, and then for your custom code, there's this script called the Drupal Module Upgrader which is a Drush command you can run that will both, uh, it has two modes. One will just print off a report that says here's all the things that you need to change. And I actually recommend doing that first because that kind of teaches you the new API changes in Drupal 8. Um, but if you're lazy like me, there's also a command that will attempt to upgrade the entire module. And it won't get it 100% of the way there, but it maybe gets it like 70% of the way there. Um, the demo video on the homepage actually has it turning on the diff module without blowing up your site after running the tool. So it's uh, pretty cool. Might not work right now. If it doesn't, let me know and I'll make you a maintainer. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the second initiative I want to talk about is uh, content workflow. This is a pretty exciting one. So um, this initiative is great. Basically, the maintainers of both the deploy suite and the workbench suite, if you're familiar with those modules in Drupal 7, uh, they're combining forces to try and get their stuff into core for Drupal 8. Um, so they want to get revisions on just about everything, including menus, um, blocks, these kinds of things, so that you can basically do an entire full site preview of changes that you're about to make, not just the content, but also the surrounding blocks and menus and taxonomy terms and various other things. Um, also the ability to configure different workflow states and transitions so you can move your content from draft to pending legal review to pending legal review two to send it to the media guy to whatever whatever all those complicated things and assigning who can do those kinds of transition and, and that kind of stuff that's all planned and, and actually pretty close um, so content moderation I have 8.2 question mark because this is one of the patches that's what's so-called a beta target. So if it makes it in within the next month, it will be an 8.2. Otherwise, it'll end up being 8.3. Um, so content moderation is basically the workbench moderation module renamed uh, for core. And uh, what this allows you to do is set up these different workflow states, draft, published, uh, this kind of stuff, as well as uh, configure who is allowed to move content from one state to another. Um, and then when you define the states in the little save button on your, uh, on your note form, you'll see a little drop down with the different types of things that you can do, like move things back to review or up to draft, that kind of stuff. Um, so publishing workflow, and then as a result of that, um, adding revisions to everything and allowing revisions to be on by default um, is another big change that happened in 8.2. Um, full site preview will be a little bit further along. I don't know how well you guys can see this. Um, this is the deploy module. What it's showing is that your live site has no content in it right now, but your staging site has the whole thing all knocked out, including the menus, blocks, various different things. And then there's a deploy um, button that you click, and it will move everything from your staging workspace into your live workspace, and it seamlessly deals with, you know, making sure your content doesn't override each other in this kind of thing. Yeah. I believe it can be either one. Yep, that's a good question. So I believe it's either configured so it's on the same site or the other one. I'm not sure though, it's definitely optimized to having a totally separate environment because um, that makes people sleep better at night. <laughs> so, um, but the workbench moderation stuff, that all definitely deals with the same site. So you can have things in drafts sitting alongside things that are published um, in, the same, in the same website. Um, so current status, we're very close on content moderation, lots of underlying revision system uh, improvements. The next up is they're going to enable crap, which is uh, create, read, archive, and purge, as opposed to create, read, update, and delete. I know. We love our little acronyms in the IT industry. Um, and this is really great because then you can have things like a trash button uh, and an undo button and things like this, and you can you, the system becomes a lot more robust because you can actually recover from something being deleted 
and then you only can wipe things out of the system if you really, really intend to do that. All right, so here's a bunch of jumping off points. Um, that issue about the workflow initiative, that's probably the best example right now we have of one of these big initiative plans. They've got like subsection F, Q, J, I don't know, like it's very detailed. Um, but lots of places in there to jump off in, and, and there's some background information as well if you're interested in listening to those. Um, API first is one that's sort of halfway between an active initiative and in planning. Um, so we shipped with a web services module in Drupal 8, um, and it has a REST API, which is great. You know, you can get things in and out of Drupal. But it was uh, limited a bit. It only worked on content, which would be things like users, content, um, I don't know, blocks, certain blocks, not all blocks, this kind of thing. So you run into limitations with it. It would work with a taxonomy terms, but not taxonomy vocabulary. So that would get into a fun thing where you could get a list of all the terms for a content, but you couldn't actually find the label of what the field was called and stuff like that. Um, so things like that, various rough edges have been exposed as people try to use those in real life. Um, we also adopted a standard called HAL, which back in 2002, or 2002, 2012 seemed like a good idea, but now there are more emergent standards that are a lot more agreed upon that would be good to, uh, to adopt. And then this whole thing was basically optimized for back-end developers. It wasn't really taking front-end developers who, for example, want to make a totally decoupled Angular or Vue.js um, front-end. <laughs> um, and, and use Drupal as a dumb you know, content store, effectively. So we have some different um, ideas on how to solve some of these problems. So JSON API is sort of the adopted standard that a lot of people uh, really like. Um, I know Ed Faulkner from the Ember community pushes this a lot, and it's essentially like an agreed upon standard for how the JSON coming out of a web service ought to be formatted and how the API calls ought to go. Uh, and basically their project page says, our, our goal is to eliminate bike shedding. <laughs> so that sounds good. They have a contrib project right now, which is pretty far along, and the goal is in 8.3, so sometime in the next six months, to try and move that into core as an alternate uh, standard that, that uh, core can export. Um, at Acquia, we're also working on something called Waterwheel, which is a JavaScript uh, software development kit. So if you're a JavaScript developer and you want to, you know, you don't want this huge glop of JSON that includes weird Drupal-ish properties, this allows you to query the API in your own native language. Um, so it's a JavaScript wrapper, essentially, around the REST API that, that a lot of people are excited about. Um, lots and lots and lots of REST improvements made it to 8.2. So we support things like um, the ability to get um, you know, anything about views, uh, image styles, all those configuration entity type things. We also vastly simplified the configuration of the REST API because it used to be this hugely nested YAML of Doom, and now it's a lot more straightforward. Um, improvements to views and comments, and also a lot of developer experience improvements. So, like, it returns errors that actually make sense, which is nice, you know, as opposed to obscure, abstract things. Um, and in the meantime, all these various things are evolving in Contrib. GraphQL is another thing that Dries pushes a lot. This allows you to combine um, in one essentially HTTP request, getting back a bunch of different things. Um, so, you can say, I want all of the content with this property all back in one request. Um, but it's still a little bit sci-fi, so I didn't really mention it here, but, uh, but yeah. Um, so lots of ways to help with that as well. I'm going to pause for a second here. Is this okay in terms of level of detail, in terms of... Okay, great. I see thumbs up and head nods. Great. All right, moving on. Media. This is the one I'm really excited about because it makes me so sad when people mm -hmm. choose WordPress because Drupal just looks really inflexible and incapable out of the box to be able to do things like, I don't know, put a video in a post. What? Anyway, so uh, this one is pretty exciting for me. So the media initiative uh, dates all the way back to 2007, I believe. This is a group of very longtime contributors, Dave Reed, who I don't see here, but I think usually comes to this camp. Um, what's that? Oh. Retreat. oh, well, that definitely takes precedence. Lullabot retreats are awesome. So, um, But yeah, so Dave Reed, uh, Yanez, Slash RSM, uh, Willie Kay, like a bunch of different people have worked on this through the years um, and have developed this stack of modules that's extremely powerful. It's very configurable. The architecture is very solid. You can do anything with it. But it is very complex to configure. 
It's sort of like how multilingual was back in Drupal 7. It was like you could do anything with multilingual if you knew the 35 modules that you needed and exactly how to configure them in such a way. Um, so we're hoping to solve that problem, uh, the way that we solve the multilingual problem in Drupal 8. Because now in Drupal 8, those 30 modules are three modules, and you just turn them on to get whatever functionality that you want. We're hoping that a media solution in core is similar. Um, we need this because without media out of the box, Drupal looks really bad compared to its competitors and really all of its competitors because people expect modern websites to work a certain way these days. Um, so we want something that just works out of the box configuration for just basic 80% cases, but something that's built on top of this powerful, flexible architecture so that we don't lose the benefits for, for the fancy stuff we want to do. So some things that we've been talking about are things like reusable images, like a media library. So this actually exists in Contrib right now. It's called File Browser, and it builds off the Entity Browser module. Um, and what this allows you to do is select from existing media that you've already uploaded to your site. So that's really handy. So you can bulk upload a bunch of images that you want to be able to select from and then pull them all out and pull them into your content. There's also things like embedded media. So we want to be able to take a video that you've posted elsewhere and embed that directly into the, um, the piece of content that you have. So this is using entity embed. Um, there's also oembed and other standards like that. So this is another area we really want to focus on. Um, the current status is the uh, media team is in the process of drafting a core plan for community review. So we've, they have uh, weekly calls every Wednesday, so we've been on a few of those talking about, you know, we've got this big stack and contrib, how do we get this kind of finals? They're a little bit in a bad, they're not in a bad state, but just, you know, it is what it is, where they're trying to finish their contrib versions and get stuff in core at the same time. And so they're kind of pulled in two different directions. So right now they're focusing on getting contrib solid. So that way people who have Drupal 8 sites have a you know, standard base they can pull from and then working on getting this stuff into 8.3 and later. Um, there are Drupal 8 versions of just about everything in the media suite though. This uh, blog post that just went up from Yanez um, basically covers a bunch of things that just came out for media entity, entity embed, entity browser, all this kind of stuff. Um, and that allows them to focus more on the solution modules. So in Drupal 7, we had the media module that was kind of a click it once and forget it, and it configured all of the things. They're working on stuff like that now, so you don't need to know all the names of the 30 special modules in order to get this stuff working. And then the hope is that a lot of that stuff will make it into core properly. So, um, so here's a bunch of stuff on how to help with that. Um, and this is an area where they really, really, really are starving for people to help them. You know, you've got a team that's been working nonstop for like, I don't know, I can't math this early in the morning, but a long time, whatever 2016 minus seven, 2007 is. Nine years, there we go. <laughs> um, and they also need people to test the various contributing modules in different configurations. So they've got some of that happening. A lot of the Drupal 8 distributions are being built with using this stuff, but it's always great to get outside feedback on, on this stuff, especially if outside feedback comes with tests. So. Um, there we go. <clears throat> Blocks and layouts is the next big thing. Um, so we got a lot, a lot, a lot of improvements in Drupal 8 around the block system. You can do things like add a block multiple times on a page. Their blocks are fieldable now, so you can add like an add code field to a block. Um, you can create your own custom block types, so you can say this is a, you know, this is a promotion block versus this is a, I don't know what other kinds of blocks you might want. I don't know, a jumping jack block, I don't know. Um, however, layouts, not so much. We got a certain amount of the way with layouts, but then we had to rip all of it out because it wasn't ready in time for Drupal 8, so that was a bit sad. Um, but we have done a few things, like uh, the contrib efforts around layouts have done a lot of consolidation work. So for example, display suite and panels are both built on the same architecture called layout plugin in contrib. So there's been a lot of good you know, collaboration happening around the new Drupal 8 systems, but Drupal 8 itself, uh, at least currently, doesn't ship with a layout solution. Uh, so the goal is we want to provide something like panels and core, but a lot easier to use for people um, and that kind of thing. I'm going to be careful what I say because David Snowpeck's in the back and he's going to throw tomatoes at me. But, um, so we did do a little bit of this in 8.2. There's this uh, cool experimental module that allows you to place blocks from the front end. And all it does is it adds a little place block icon and you click it. And then just like on the block demonstration page that probably no one even realizes exists, um, it pops open all the regions and then you can click place block anywhere in there. And that's actually hugely beneficial because we've done usability testing and everybody who we test wants to do things from the site that they're looking at. 
So when you tell them, like, in order to add a block to a page, you have to leave the front end of your site and go traipsing through the admin interface and try and divine, if I were a Drupal core developer, what would I have called that thing and where would I have put it? And that's always a fun thing. Um, so you eventually find your way to admin, structure, whatever, whatever. And then you have a big honking table with draggable rows but no visual cues as to where the things are going to end up. So you essentially have two browser windows open and you're like, nope, nope, and you just kind of say, so anyway, anyone been through that before? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not fun. Uh, so this is a really nice feature. We're hoping to get some CSS, CSS people, anyone, maybe, huh? Uh, to make that a little less ugly because yellow, wah! But you know, the, the functionality itself though is great. Um, one of the things that they're hoping to start on, so the, the initial steps to get this layout functionality in Core, what they actually want to start on is sort of display suite-like functionality and putting per content type layouts in Core. So rather than trying to attack the problem of globally, how do you make these layouts that can affect you know, the entire site or one particular node or this kind of a thing. We're gonna instead focus on the problem of, well, we've got these, um, you know, th we've got these display values. Why don't we just let you customize the layouts on those? And so that's kind of where things are headed is, is first uh, having a bunch of pre-configured layouts that you can select from um, that act on. So you can make your articles look different from your pages and this kind of a thing. And then from that building block, build out the more functionality for the, for the whole entire site. Um, and so eventually what we want to end up with is the ability to do swappable layouts. We even did some sci-fi stuff in Drupal uh, 8 around like responsive layout builders so you could like make a layout that swooshed around in your cell phone and stuff like that. I don't know if we'll get that far. That might be more like 8.6 or something, but, um, but the, the point being that um, this is all the, kind of the general direction that we want to go in. We want to be able to provide layouts, swap between them seamlessly, have that all happen on the front end. Um, without having to be Earl Miles and be able to figure out how panels works. Um, or David Snowpeck, as you were, so. Um, so there's a core plan that was discussed at DrupalCon New Orleans um, that's currently being drafted for community review. Um, again, we want to start with display suite like functionality and then expand out. Um, and then in the meantime, as similar to the media team, all of the various panels related modules are being worked on in Contrib. Um, and it seems like that's going really well. I don't know, David, did you want to add anything to that? It's going forward. <laughs> <laughs> you can always use more dolphin in the initiatives. Uh, we've also been at it for quite a long time. Uh, early on, we were focused on core and core that was got really interesting in the use of initiatives. Um, but yeah, anyone's interested in initiatives, you can come to the Awesome. So yep, D8 panels. Uh, there's a uh, Drupal Scotch channel, which is a whole backstory thing. I don't even remember the backstory. Basically, the Web Services Initiative got acronymed to WSCII, which they pronounced whiskey. And so this one got backronymed somehow so that it was Scotch. And then the views and core initiative was vodka. And we are all, we have, our community likes heavy drinking. So anyway, <laughs> that kind of thing. So yes, help David get panels ported, and that would be lovely. All right, data modeling. So this is sort of in the, wouldn't this be cool phase? Um, so what is this? Um, essentially, two of Drupal's biggest strengths are the fact that it has this structured data modeling, so entities and fields. The fact that you can you know, create these sort of abstract concepts of content and then reuse them in multiple ways. And then the visualization capabilities, which is the views module. Like if you look at Drupal compared to any of its competitors, that's definitely the, the main thing that has kept it alive as long as it has, because it's perfect for a world where you have no idea what the heck is gonna view your site. You have no idea like what new device is gonna come out down the road, because all of your stuff is architected in such a way that it can be freely mixed, matched, reused, displayed in visually in a number of different ways. But those are also two of the hardest things for new users to grasp, like really hard. Um, and you usually bang your head on the table for quite a while before you can kind of figure out views and any API and stuff like that. So wouldn't it be great if we could get people to their aha moment with Drupal on a much, much shorter time frame? And let's talk about this because I think a lot of people in here use these interfaces every day and maybe don't realize how inscrutable they are for normal people. So this is what the field UI looks like in Drupal 8. And you get this selector box with 400 options in it, 
all of them look exactly the same. So a couple of things about this. One is like things that you use a lot, like text, are off the fold, or they're below the folds. So you can't even know that there's a text option here without scrolling. Secondly, because it's in alphabetical order by field group, the first thing in the list is Boolean, which is like not something you usually use. So we were in usability testing, and one of the participants was like, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know what Boolean means, but it must be important because it's the first thing on the list. So I went off to <laughs> Google it, and anyway, it's, it's not good. The other thing is that this is all organized around the data types of, of what you're storing, which makes sense. It's a data modeling tool. But what users are usually trying to do here when they get here is they're trying to add a field to a form. It's a visual thing that they're trying to accomplish. So they want to add a checkbox, or they want to add a radio button selector or something like that. They're not thinking in terms of, do I want a number float? OK, that's not how they come in here. So, And then the last problem, and this is a problem pervasive with Drupal, is there's no preview of what you're about to do. So once again, you got to have the two windows open, because you're, you're, the form you're actually affecting is way over here somewhere. And then here, you're setting up this abstract idea of a content type. So an interim solution to this is uh, by Peter Addix which is called Dream Fields. And it's kind of hard to see on the screen here, but it basically inverts the selection. So you start by selecting the widget that you want. So I want a drop down, I want an, uh, a, like a reference field, I want an autocomplete, this kind of thing. And then you select, oh, and by the way, this is taxonomy, or by the way, this is a number, or something like that. Um, which makes it a lot easier for people to grasp. You see a little picture of what it's going to look like before you click on it, that kind of thing. So this actually exists in Contrib right now. It's called the Dream Fields module, and there's a core patch, which I don't think is going to make it an 8.2 at this point, but hopefully for 8.3, because that would be great. And then Dries proposed this sci-fi stuff, which is kind of doubling down on the fact that this is a data modeling tool. So like, let's actually give people tools to build out their data models. So give them little like lines they can click to indicate uh, relationships between entities and this kind of thing. So, like Microsoft Access for the 21st century. But <laughs> I'm sorry if that, I should have put a trigger warning on that. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, and then the Views UI. Uh, so we have, this, we have this thing in Drupal 8, uh, which is the contextual links now have like the friendly pencil icon, right? So that's great, except that the friendly pencil icon sometimes takes you to this thing, and it like scares the bejesus out of everyone. Um, I have a bullet point here. It frightens young children and grizzled veterans alike because it's, <laughs> it's all of the options you could possibly need, all at the exact same visual hierarchy. So you have no idea what you're doing until you've clicked on every single thing and kind of, you know, done this whole thing. With. And then there is a preview to show you what you're doing, but it's way down here below the fold. And you have to kind of scroll up and down and this kind of thing. So one interim solution that's in the queue right now is flip it so that the preview of what you're doing is the main. Thing in the window and put all the options off to the side. So kind of like the node form is in Drupal 8. Uh, and then even allow people to click in the preview and do different things like hide elements and stuff like that. So there's a, there's a patch in the core queue to do some work around that. Um, and then I think the penultimate sci-fi thing we'd want to do is sort of do whatever we can do to combine the field and um, views UIs to really give people a picture of what Drupal can do. But I don't have any mock-ups for that. But if you're like the kind of person who's like, I see everything in four dimensions, that would be great to have a conversation about. Um, so this UI is better in that it only scares small children, not also people like us. So that's good. Um, so the current status of the data modeling initiative is we don't yet have a formal team or plan kind of posted. But there's just a couple of people doing these things sort of ad hoc as uh, itches that they're scratching. But nobody really coming together and saying, I have a vision for how to solve data modeling in core. Um, but here's some links to different uh, things that are going on. And then we're on to theme component library. Um, have people, like, going back to this one real quick, um, have people sort of, like, done, have you ever sat down with a new user in front of Views UI and, and what, you know, comforted them in their moment of pain? Yeah, I see people, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, if you have experience with this and have ideas on how we can make that better for people, we definitely want to hear them. Because again, it's one of those things where once you get it, it's like your whole mind explodes and you can do anything in the world is like at my fingertips. But until then, it, it is actually really sad and frustrating. So, All right, so the theme component library. Um, 
What this is about is that we have this theme and render system that has been carried along since Drupal 6 and sort of gotten progressively more and more and more complex as it's gone around. So we have you know, pound type versus pound theme. We have these pre-render, post-render, after build, these different stages that happen. Um, and it's really, really difficult for even very advanced core developers to understand how everything works. Um, and we have these templates, which are great because they give control to the themers, but often, you know, the template has like print content. And then content is this blob of pre-rendered HTML that came from a render array somewhere. Um, and it's really inflexible, especially if you're like, say, a JavaScript developer who's trying to, you know, create an alternate front end UI, and you just really want to get the accessibility properties out of there, but you want to rewrite the markup yourself. Um, so it's actually really annoying. So instead, what we're proposing here is to develop all these individual UI elements as components that can sort of be mixed and matched independently at Drupal. Have people heard of atomic design before? Is this sort of like a trendy buzzword thing? Okay, um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But this gives us a lot of different benefits. So we have a built-in pattern library, we have a built-in style guide, so you can have the theme print out a page, it's like, here's everything I know how to theme, and you can adjust the style sheets for headings, you know, form buttons, these kinds of things all in one place. Um, and it allows us to interface previews, client-side re-rendering, all kinds of cool stuff. So this is a very brief overview of what atomic design is about. So atomic design is about it's designing these tiny little pieces of the interface that come together later. So we call those atoms. You know, sort of like the smallest part of your site is like a button with a blue arrow on it, or it's a uh, it's a you know preview pixel thing, or you know whatever it is. You form atoms into molecules. So you might say take the back button and the reload button, put it together to make a header. And you might take the, uh, you know, the, the little ghosty image thing next to the link and make that into like the sidebar. And then you form the molecules into organisms. So here's the entire content window. Here's the footer place. Here's the header place. And then you form those into templates, which are then used in multiple different places. And then it results in the end result as a page that a user views with everything all sort of filled in. So the advantage of this approach is if you decide you want to change your headers from blue to pink instead. You make the change once to your atoms and it iterates through the whole entire design and it's sort of like sort of like SSI back in the day if people are super old school. It's like making design change in one place and then it percolates everywhere. Um, so that's a really, really smart idea. So the idea is get Drupal to be more based on this. Give people control with templates all the way down to be able to, uh, to do this kind of stuff. Um, so the current status of this is there's definitely enthusiastic agreement on the general idea. Everyone is like, oh my god, yes, this would be way better than what we have. But then there's a lot of very strong opinions about the details in terms of like, how would we implement this? Um, do we use Twig as it is? Or do we use Twig as like an intermediary layer, layer where we're like translating render arrays into things? Like, lots of people kind of disagreeing on those sorts of details. Um, in Contrib, the Zen theme is actively sort of experimenting with this idea. Um, and there's a module called Components that the Zen theme utilizes to sort of like use Twig as sort of like a translation layer between taking these big complicated render APIs and then outputting them in something that themers and front end developers can use. Um, and so to work out these details, there's a coalition of people that are currently going back and forth about. Um, how they might make a new theme for Drupal 8, because Drupal 8 just ships with the same default theme that Drupal 7 shipped with. So you might look at it and be like, eh, they're basically the same, but they're not at all. Um, and then that would also be pretty. So it's like a pretty way of testing this theory, and, uh, and that would be really cool. Um, so there's a bunch of links here uh, you know, to proposing new core theme. This main tracking issue outlays is like a whim issue, so it's like very detailed with lots of bullet points and headings and bolds and stuff. Um, but it's a pretty good um, you know, outline of the problem that's, that's there. So if you've ever been very confused or frustrated by render API and stuff like that, this would be a really good thing to work on. And it's an interesting problem because in order to get it into a Drupal 8 version, we have to do it in a backwards compatible way. So we have to discuss a lot about what that means, if that means you know, doing something that's an opt-in API that's new, or if it means uh, doing something alongside of the existing API or, or how exactly that looks. But it's an interesting problem and there's a lot of front-end developers who are really, really passionate to see this solved. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, with the pattern lab, 
comfortable with uh, thing? Is that something that's actually being looked at for like by Drupal, or is that something that was just done on the side by someone else? Pattern Lab, like Brad Frost thing? Yeah. Because I yeah. saw that there, it's on GitHub that there's a, a Pattern Lab Drupal showcase thing. I've seen that too, mm -hmm. and I don't know for sure how that's implemented. Like at the end of the day, what we want is we want something that supersedes the render API. So it's a little, it's a little bit more than just a theme, because mm -hmm. the theme is going to take what Drupal spits out and niceify it up, and then end up with something pretty in a template file. We need to move that niceifying up uh, further. I know that that theme was mentioned in the big long discussion that's linked here, but I'm not sure if that's being actively looked at or not. It's worth pinging that and saying, "Hey, this thing is cool," because if you, especially if they are doing some of that intermediary translation stuff, because yeah. that's the really tough problem people aren't sure how to solve. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just wondering because you said comic design, so. Yeah. 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 That that's definitely where they're they're taking inspiration from, though, for sure. And then the last one, I have the obligatory picture of Big Brother watching you, because um, this one is cross-channel orchestration. So this is like, if you don't have enough problems, now your shoes are spying on you. So that's really cool. Um, so <laughs> what is this one? Um, at, at the, at the essence of this one is actually pretty cool. It's, um, you know, we're kind of moving to an age where websites are sort of passe. It's like, yeah. You, you really are, you know, when people have Apple Watches and they have like toasters that talk to them at night or whatever they have, mm -hmm. um, that sort of stuff, it's like, uh, we need to be expand Drupal beyond the point where it's just for web stuff because the entire internet is moving beyond just web stuff. Um, and I actually really like this idea because, um, you know, to me it's kind of the same idea as like, y'all, a lot of you use Drupal 6, right, at some point. Um, if not, in Drupal 6, there was this movement to make everything a node because nodes were cool. They had revisions and comments and stuff like this. So why don't we just make everything a node? That would be really great because then we can everything else. And so you like bend and twist nodes in this weird, awkward way in order to get you know, comments that you could comment on, stuff like that. Um, in Drupal 7, the way we went about that is we said, no, let's pull up a level. Instead of making everything a node, let's make everything an entity and nodes are one type of entity, and users, and comments, and things like this. So right now, Drupal can do all these cool things. It can talk to Alexa, it can do all kinds of stuff. But we're bending Drupal in weird ways in order to do that, in a lot of cases. It's a little less bendy in Drupal 8, like there's actually APIs for this, but you know, there's a lot. In Drupal 7, for example, you just have to kill the entire request in order to output JSON before a theme kind of jumped in there and, and messed with all your stuff. So to me, I like this idea because it abstracts Drupal out. We've got you know, great tools for building layouts, for, cons you know, for making tokenized message things. Instead of targeting those just at web pages, specifically pull it back a level and make it so it can work for SMS messages or Apple Watch notifications or things like that. Um, and they also want to do this stuff smartly, so it's taking into account context. And this is where the Big Brother stuff comes in. So it's keeping track of like where you are, what time of day it is, you know, what Pokemon you've caught that day, this kind of thing, and like customizing the notifications based on that. Um, so I have this video maybe that will work. Whoops. Let's see if that'll work or not. And if you've seen Dries's keynote. We have hundreds of stores. What's your zip code so I can locate the nearest one? 19042. Here's the fruit that's on sale at Gourmet Market on 72nd and Broadway. Apples are currently 50 cents a pound. Bananas are on sale for 20 cents each. Anything else I can help with? Um, there's an uh, awesome sauce on sale. Sauce is 
She's clicking a checkbox called on sale, as you would. <laughs> <laughs> So that's an actual proof of concept demo that really works. So kind of cool that Drupal can do this kind of stuff. But the idea is a, uh, building um, <laughs> infrastructure to be able to construct uh, experiences like that, just like we can construct web pages right now without having to know everything that goes into the HTML. Right? Um, so the current status of this is we don't have a team or a plan or anything identified for Drupal core, but there are a lot of plumbing bits of this in Contrib. So for example, there's uh, the rules module lets you take uh, you know, different actions that are happening and wire them up to other stuff that, that's going on. Um, the message module is sort of a wrapper around different types of notifications, email, SMS, this kind of thing. Um, and then if you want to think around with an Alexa, if you like something omniscient in your house reporting back to Amazon about everything that you're doing, there's also a module for that. So, um, And then a bonus one, this is an, an actually defined initiative, but I want to talk a little bit about usability because that's a team that's recently got off the ground and is kind of doing some cool stuff. So we've been doing uh, these uh, usability tests for years, both formally and informally. So the University of Minnesota has hosted us a few times um, in their little usability lab with like the one-way glass and the eye tracking and everything. It's really cool. Um, but we keep coming back with a lot of the same central themes, like the terminology in Drupal scares the living bejesus out of everybody. Um, users have a huge reliance on previews, like they really want to see what's going to happen before they do it. When they don't have it, they get scared. Um, they think that Drupal is brittle and inflexible. Um, and then the Russian nesting dolls of abstraction. So uh, the way one user described it is, you know, I can't just add content to my sidebar, right? I have to make a block and put it in a view, and put the view in a region, and put the region in a theme, and, da, 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 and it's just like this whole kind of complex things where people really want to look at the site and what it's doing and then work out from there. Um, so we're working on this patch in core right now that we hope is going to make it into uh, 8.2, which is called uh, Outside In. So this enables you to, from the front end of your site, enter edit mode, and then uh, go ahead and configure things like blocks and all these kinds of things right from the front end without having to once again divine where a Drupal core developer put that thing at one time. Um, so this is an active development right now. Hopefully we'll make it into 8.2, if not over 8.3. Um, so you can do things like place a block in a region, these kinds of things uh, would be really, really cool to see. Um, drag and drop image uploads is another one that's really close. Um, so when you're quick at it, you can see there's an image here. You click on it, you drag something in from your desktop, and all of a sudden, Elaine has turned into uh, Newman. Yeah, Newman. I almost said Newton. That's not right at all. Um, but a nice little quick usability improvement that would make that look a lot more slick. Um, there's also folks working on a redesigned admin status page to kind of escalate the kind of most important things worth uh, looking at, uh, kind of make that more designed for the 21st century, and various other things. Um, this is an initiative I'm really passionate about, which is sample content in the install profile. Because what happens when you install Drupal 8 right now? Or 7? Anybody know? You get a blank page that says, you don't have any content yet. Have fun with that. It's like, <laughs> what? You know, there's nothing about, like, you've just installed a world-class enterprise CMS, whoop, whoop, a digital experience, blah, whatever. There's nothing about that. There's nothing about what a view is or blocks or any of that crap. No, it's just like, you don't have any content yet. Shame on you. And so then you just, like, wander around lost, like, well, I, I don't want it to yell at me, so I guess I'll start making content. You don't know what you're doing, and you just make a whole mess of it, and it's a whole disaster. So what if... Drupal 8 shipped with some stuff in the box that actually showed you what Drupal was capable of. Um, so there's some people who over the years have worked on this problem off and on, and it always ended with, yeah, but none of those modules are in core, so what can we do? But now, a lot of those modules are in core, and so we could do things like have the default install profile be an event website, or we could have you know, it be a community site, or these kinds of things, um, which would be really, really awesome. Um, so this initiative is called Snowman. Um, and I would love to see this picked back up again for 8.3 because if Drupal actually communicated the power of what it could do within the first five seconds of installation, that would be hugely beneficial for adoption and a number of other things. Um, so the usability team has these twice weekly meetings, one at a North America friendly time and one at a European friendly time, where we actually get 
on Google Hangouts, we show each other what we're working on. And this is a great opportunity for you to propose changes that you're really passionate about or to find things that other people are working on that you could maybe help with. Because we, uh, we have a lot of designers who make cool designs, but then very few people who actually say, oh, I could do that, you know. Um, so if you're a developer type who just wants to be told what to do, as we all do, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> um, no, but it's a, it's a really cool, I really enjoyed these, these talks because it's, uh, it's a lot of people really passionate about improving Drupal um, so that it's accessible to people who aren't rocket scientists and stuff like that. Not that us group of rocket scientists aren't amazing, but you know, it would just be great if we had a, a more diverse community. So that is my spiel, and not sure how I'm doing for time. I think I still have like 20 minutes or so. Is that right? Confirm or deny? Yes, OK. So anyway, I will take your questions on anything. Drupal 8 related, community related, no math, please. We covered that. I'm terrible at math. Um, but anything else that you want to know? Yes. Right. It's, I know enough to even go to the URL or The answer to that is definitely yes. But yes, I know what you mean. It's tricky because actually even compiling the resources for this talk was hard. It's like there isn't really a centralized resource even listing all this stuff, so that's a problem we have to solve. But I think what you're asking for is something I've kind of dreamed about too, which is like kind of like a, one of those choose your own adventure books. That's like, I have five minutes. Or I have a weekend, or I have what, you know what I mean? And it's like, you have five minutes, great. Here, here's a list of issues that you can help with. Oh, you have a weekend, awesome. Here's like a bunch of things you could help with. It's tricky though, because these issues are, um, there's no like Drupal company, right? Like there's no like, you know, organization tasked with sifting through all of these issues and sort of combining. So it's all done grassroots ad hoc kind of thing. And so we have some mechanisms for that, like there's the novice tag that we use to tag uh, issues that probably could be solved in something between five minutes and a weekend. Um, but the problem is that people tagging those are often like, you know, genius level people are like, well, this would be a, such a simple patch to merely reinvent a database abstraction API to blah, 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 you know, and it's just like, maybe not. But, um, and so it's, it's tricky that way. I would say the, I would say go by these topics. If you're interested in usability, what I would do if I were in your shoes is show up to one of these meetings, register your interest in them, meet the people who are involved with that initiative, um, and see what they're working on. And this is a way, and at this conference actually, you know, there'll probably be people on the sprint day working with laptops. That's kind of how I got so sucked into Drupal is I just like walked up to a table of people and asked, what are you guys working on? They were like, we're working on shipping Drupal 4.7 at that time. And I was like, neat, I don't know if I can help with that, but I'm gonna sit with you and kind of figure it out. And, and that, it was amazing. It's just kind of getting FaceTime with people and that sort of thing. So when you're at an event like this, definitely capitalize on that. Talk to people in the hallways, this kind of thing. But when you're not here, I would say go by topics that you're interested in. And oftentimes they don't have a ready-made list pre-curated of like the things that would be good for you if you're a you know, site builder with five years experience or this kind of thing. But if you tell them the kind of things they're interested in, often one-on-one -on -one interactions, they'd be like, oh, I have the perfect idea for you. Or, hey, maybe you can assist this guy on this thing because he really needs someone who hasn't worked on this the whole time to look at it and make sure it makes sense, that kind of stuff. But definitely, I would go people first um, and then branch out from there because, yeah, we don't yet have the... What we need is we need that cross-channel big brother thing to, like, you know, automatically know your entire background and then match make you with... We need, like, the OK Cupid of Drupal issues, but we don't have that yet. Um, but, uh, but it's a really good thing for us to strive towards because I agree, there's, there's a lot of different things. I'd also be interested in like what, you know, if we were going to do a choose your own adventure book, like what are the things that we would, like what would be the inflection points there? You know, like one is level of experience, I think one is time, I think one is interest, you know, but it would be cool to capture a lot of those and kind of think about how that could actually work. Because if we had something like that, I think that would be amazing. Um, because it is, it is really hard to kind of get into the community when it's just like a bucket of issues that all look the same. So.
<laughs> Other questions? <laughs> yeah. You, you touched on accessibility, and mm -hmm. I was curious about what, um, I know with Drupal 7, um, accessibility like within the WYSIWYG, so CK Editor was not very good. So I was wondering what, what uh, they touched on within Drupal to make it more accessible. Yeah, so in, um, in, Drupal, uh, in Drupal Core, we have these gates. One of them is accessibility, where something doesn't make it to a stable feature. Experimental is different than a stable feature of Drupal Core until it passes that gate. So CK Editor actually had to do a bunch of work on their editor in order for it to make it into Drupal Core. So if you try it now, it would be much more improved compared to what it was. Okay. Um, so th some things that we did around that are, for example, um, we created a uh, configuration interface which is nice for, for visual people. It's you know drag and drop little buttons that you can add back and forth and this kind of thing. But um, made sure all of that is tabbable and the arrow keys work to move things back and forth and this kind of thing. The uh, toolbar implementation that Drupal 8 ships with is actually the, um, we had a blind user, Ezra or Everett, who was helping us with this. And he said that from now on, when people contact him as an accessibility consultant on how to make an accessible nav menu, he's just gonna say download Drupal 8 because it automatically has all the things with expanding and collapsing and how to you know, navigate all this stuff. We use ARIA, oh, I don't know all the words, but you know what I mean, like that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of focus placed on, on those kinds of things. So yeah, so the, the CK editor, it allows you to tab to all the different interfaces. They all have alt attributes to explain this is bolding text, this is this. It will explain where in the WYSIWYG you are. So it talks about like highlighting and different stuff like that. So I haven't tried it in a while, like in um, voiceover or those kinds of things, but I do know that in order to ship Drupal 8, it had to pass all of those gates. And, and, and also for building content for users, it builds content that is accessible, so. Yes. Okay. I mean, that that's all just HTML stuff, yeah, exactly. so yeah. So there's not a lot there that's tricky. The tricky parts are where the interface is doing some kind of swooshy thing. Mm -hmm. Like, content time creation is not fancy in any way. So that one we didn't really have accessibility problems, but like with in-place editing and with the toolbar and stuff like that, we had to do a bunch of work to make sure that that was read out loud in a way that made sense to, to users. So, yep. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and then one of the experimental modules that ships with uh, Drupal 8, it didn't quite make it into core as a stable release, is inline form errors. So this uh, allows you to create a list of what's wrong with your form at the top. Yeah. So you can tap through there and then link directly to the, um, the element that has the issue. And that was an important accessibility feature as well that we didn't get into Drupal 7. And hopefully we'll get into Drupal 8 as a stable release by 8.3. So. Other questions? You should make me stand here awkwardly. I'll dance. No, I'm just I won't subject you to that. I have a question. Yes. How are the teams being selected? So far, the teams have been self-selecting, and then Dries has just blessed them. The only initiatives with a real team behind them at the moment are content workflow. Um, and so they got together and they were like, we're a team, and Dries is like, cool. Um, media hasn't come together yet with a actual core proposal, so they're not, they're kind of in this limbo where they're like, they're working on a bunch of stuff, but they don't yet have a plan issue for core, so it's unclear. What about the UX? Do they have a team? They have a team, but they're not an initiative. Mm. So they didn't need to be pre-blessed. They're so like they, a baby community initiative? Baby community initiative? Not or? really a baby, but yeah, they're a community initiative. Yeah. So like there's Boyan and Yoroi are the usability topic maintainers, mm. and then I'm a product manager, so informally we're the team. And then Gabor is like the initiative coordinator informally. Um, but that team hasn't really been blessed because it's not an initiative per se. Um, but if we wanted to make usability an initiative, then I think Gabor would be the coordinator. He does a lot of like the tweeting and the making sure meetings happen and this kind of stuff. Um, and then when we come together, it's one of the four of us who generally leads the meetings, and they happen very ad hoc, though. So is there a, is there a template for an initiative now, which is like, hey, you want to have an initiative? You can't be an initiative until you have a coordinator, uh, you know, a developer, what's its, and a like the roles that in the past found that were effective for the successful Drupal 8 initiatives? Like, do you have a template now for? We do. Um, 
for defining things at the onset so that these initiatives can be put in a position where they can be successful so there's not as much heartache as there may have been with some other initiatives that had a lot of mm -hmm. I, uh, a I don't know passion but not a lot of structure gosh i can't find it mm. anyway somewhere in here yes there's an initiative template i mean if we go let's find the workflow issue because that's the easiest one because this is based off that template. So this is what media, blocks, and layouts, these different things are working on as a template like this. So there's the background to explain why you're doing what you're doing. There's the goals, which is what you're trying to get out of this thing. And then you start breaking your initiative down into must have, could have, should have, mm -hmm. um, which is important because before we would define initiatives as like noun and verb or whatever. Um, and then people would sort of be like, yeah, it has all the things. And they kind of jump in there without kind of focusing on, well, you could do these 1,100 things, but these three things have the highest impact, and they'll get people excited if you front load them and get them out of the way first, this kind of stuff. So we have discussions with the core committers and these initiative teams to try and determine. Like initially, the workflow, uh, the workflow initiative, like most initiatives, kind of was like, we're going to start with architectural purity. And then we're going to purify more things, and then we're going to clean up technical debt, and then we're going to, and then we're going to the other day, and then at the very end of this, then we'll have like content moderation. It's like no, 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 <laughs> like don't do that because you will burn out somewhere midway, and then we will have no user-facing functionality to show for it. So let's flip that, and let's fix your technical debt while you're putting content moderation in core, because then people are like, wow cool feature and you get to fix what you want as you go and then you pull in more volunteers who are passionate about improving that thing and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of conversations like that that happen. We talk about how to find the different processes and where that stuff happens. Um, they have a very detailed roadmap which I don't think every initiative needs but um, you know they have like the uh, phase A through I think it goes to J or something. Anyway, very, very uh, complicated roadmap. But each of these has like a meta issue that you can subscribe to if you only care about one feature. Um, they talk about what's specifically not in scope, so they don't want to deal with some of these types of issues. Um, and then they talk about related work that's going on, um, other contributed projects in this space. So the, the point of these initiative templates is it's, it sounds like a lot of busy work, but the goal is to make sure that when an initiative is ready to start, you've kind of done your research and you've kind of talked to all the people that need to be talked to and pulled them on your team. So then you have the different roles. We had a thing in, um, in Drupal 8 where the initiatives, each had initiative lead assigned, um, which was not realistic <laughs> because it's too much. Oh, it'll come back. That again. It'll come back. Um, it's too much to put something like configuration management on one person's shoulders. And often there would be these teams that would formulate around, but they wouldn't really get publicity because it was just the one guy's picture on the slide, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so in a Drupal 8.x, we're trying to be more cognizant of that and, and really set out that initially these teams should have roles like an initiative coordinator, an architect, a developer, a designer, uh, different things like that that they all work together and kind of setting that up on, on the... Uh, so we also have sign-offs. So Drupal 8 now has this governance process to try and eliminate surprises, you know, because you don't want to on both directions. You don't want to be working for two and a half years on a patch and then find out it's a bad idea. That sucks. You also don't want to be the subsystem maintainer of the entity API and find out some Yahoo went and messed with your stuff without talking to you. So the idea of sign-offs is it, it talks about outlays at the beginning. Here's who needs to be informed as this thing goes along. And in some cases, here's who needs to approve of this and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so that's what's in an initiative template. It's really nice. Yeah, it's not bad. Just made this, and it's uh, it's not for every initiative. Like if you if whatever you want to do can be done with you and a friend, or or you by yourself, you know, like you want to clean up all the periods in core or something like that. You don't need a template like this. This is something that again fits that sort of definition of initiative where it's a, a huge kind of undertaking. It's going to span multiple Drupal eight releases. It needs a team behind it to work on stuff. Um, it's going to have a lot of inflection points with different parts of the system that's when you need something like this. And so we review these in the UX meetings and we review them as core committers and um, that kind of things. So this goes back to what you were saying about like when you're looking for where you want to get involved 
And when you're at an event, you want to talk to people. Or when you're at home, you want to go to a meeting and talk to people. Like, this is one of the ways you can find out who those people are. Yep, exactly. And there's a page. Uh, this is what it used to be. I don't know what they moved it to. Main jumping off point for strategic initiatives, anyway. I can never spell that word right. There we go. Um, that has the jumping off point to all this stuff. So workflow, migrate, blocks and layout, etc. cetera. Um, so if any of those sound interesting. And then the community initiatives don't quite have a good jumping off point, but there is this. Uh, Isn't that like a child page? Yeah, there's this development roadmap page. And a lot of the stuff that's being prioritized is mentioned here. So there's where you see like, uh, yeah, B hats, some of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so to answer your question, we learned a lot of hard lessons from the Drupal 8 initiatives. We're trying to make sure going forward, they're more sustainable, um, more relevant. Uh, it's, it's cheaper and easier to cut them off at any point if they're going uh, kind of sideways. Um, and people get validation much sooner than they used to that they're going in the right direction. So, so we'll see how it works. But so far, it seems pretty promising. It'll work super. It's super. It I will. It'll work super. <laughs> yeah, so far, it's, it's pretty exciting. I mean, to see stuff like content moderation coming out of there, it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. And I'm just excited that like we got content moderation without having to wait four and a half years. What? <laughs> it's pretty cool. All right, I think I have time for one more question, if it's easy. <laughs> no, I don't know what kind of hair gel Dries uses. Uh, what's that? Where's Lily? Where's Lily? Ah, uh, she's with her mom. Yeah. One of these days, I will take her to a Drupal event, but you know, I gotta. It's hard because like I'm working, right? Like when I'm at these things, regional events are a little easier because I usually like blah 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 and then I'm done. But like Drupal cons, it's like. You know, 7 a.m. to 3 a.m., you know. And then people are like, well, I'll watch your kid. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't know you. So, like, <laughs> and also it's like, yeah, I just bring my mom everywhere. This is my mom, everybody. Hey, yay. But yeah, it's like, and adults are not interchangeable cogs to kids. It's not like, oh, now, now you're mom because you have two legs and you're tall, right? It's like, it doesn't quite work that way. But, but yeah, I would love to bring her to one of these. I did, she did see me talk at uh, Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit when she was about four months old and she slept through my entire talk. Oh. So, yeah, so some of you have that in common with my daughter, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's three now, she's awesome. Although people always talk about terrible twos and I found like twos were fine. Threes are when they really start getting a personality. Cause it used to be like, I'd be like, if she's like pulling the cat's tail or something, I'd be like, hey, don't do that one, and she would stop immediately. And now I'm like, one, and she's like, bring it, yeah, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, crap, I needed to plan this, you know. Anyway, so we're, we're working through it. No, she's great. But yeah, I will bring her at, at some point eventually, because she's, she's hilarious, you guys need to meet her. All right, thank you very much, everybody. And, uh, yeah.